A platoon of Navy SEALs makes landfall on a hostile shore. Whiskey Tango, this is Foxtrot Alpha. They locate their target 200 yards inland, a suspected terrorist hideout. High value unit standing by command HQ, you're monitoring. The SEALs work closely with a battle command center, receiving orders, gathering intelligence in the field, and sending it back. I hold you, Lima Charlie. But this command center isn't in some distant bunker or battleship. It's 15 miles offshore and invisible to the enemy. It's a self-contained underwater war machine. A guided missile submarine. Command battle station strike. Command missile preparations for launch. Again, tubes 4, 11, 12 are ready, sir. Flight Alpha, six primary missiles. No documentary film crew has ever been given permission to follow a sub like this for an extended period of time. The window, launching 4 Alpha. Until now. The USS Florida departs a naval support base in Greece after a brief stop loading provisions. She'll soon disappear under the waves and will remain hidden for the next several weeks. Her orders and her destination are known to only a few. The Florida belongs to a tiny fraternity of subs, unlike any other in the world. Designated SSGN, a guided missile nuclear-powered submarine. Two football fields of steel and state-of-the-art technology, much of it highly classified. Each submarine is 560 feet long, four stories tall, displaces over 18,000 tons submerged, and it is as quiet as any submarine out there. The SSGNs are among the biggest subs in the world, second only to the Russian Typhoon class. Longer than the Washington Monument and wider than a three-lane highway, these subs were designed to sneak Special Operations Forces in close to shore and back them up with serious firepower. Over the last 10 years or so, what we've seen is a need for completely undetectable platform. And that platform can get up close and personal to where you can launch those missiles if you need to, or to insert and retrieve soft forces. Only four SSGNs exist in the world. Check the chart. Recommend shifting to a submerged COSOE. Next watch. Scope is under. Lowering number two scope. Three six. Just under the surface, the crew checks for leaks before diving any deeper. First time that we submerged the ship, I was a nervous wreck. You know, if you take something as large as this, greater than 18,000 tons, and you put it under the ocean, it's, it's kind of an amazing feat. But once you see it, how it works together and how everybody clicks, you realize, man, this is this is the organization I want to be in. Dive, submerge ship, make your depth 160 feet. Submerge ship, make my depth 160 feet, all right? Dive, dive. The Navy will say they go as deep as 800 feet. Six, six. Their actual limits are a closely guarded secret. Good evening, Captain. This is the uh, mission brief for our upcoming op that we have planned. Mission priorities are naval special warfare insertion and then uh, follow on strike tasking. As always, safety of ship is the number one. Remain undetected, accomplish the mission. Here's an overview. You can see up here to the. Florida's been ordered 150 miles east where she'll meet up with a surface ship and take on special operations forces. Overhead from satellite imagery. We got two targets, the command headquarters and the armory. We believe that the terrorist leader is going to be meeting with the command uh, structure there. So they're gonna verify that the... Uh, They'll sneak the special operations forces in close to the shoreline of an unidentified hostile nation. Once they get on the beach, the team will locate two suspected terrorist strongholds and call in a strike. 
One, obviously, the insertion extraction of the uh, special forces uh, has to be bought at Only key personnel in the room know that this is an exercise. After the strike, we will extract them under cover of darkness based on. The sub is only a day sail from one of the world's most unstable hotspots, the Middle East. They could be called into action at any time. So it's important that every man on board believes that this is an actual mission. The Florida is the result of one of the biggest makeovers in U.S. naval history. Before 2006, she had already seen over 20 years of action as a ballistic missile submarine, or SSBN. The SSBNs were designed to carry large nuclear weapons, earning them the nickname Boomers. Up to 24 Trident ballistic missiles in each sub can be propelled out of the water and through the air at over 13,000 miles per hour. A Trident could travel the distance from New York to Moscow in 20 minutes with enough explosives to destroy a city the size of Washington, D.C. 12 times over. The SSBN during the Cold War functioned purely as a strategic nuclear deterrent. We had a potential enemy back then that had literally thousands of nuclear warheads. So the SSBNs were there to make sure that that other country understood any sort of a strike against our country or our allies could be met with a devastating strike in return. The remaining boomers are still considered America's main nuclear deterrent today. As we're speaking right now, one of those night watchmen, one of those SSBNs are out there on alert patrol and they're poised and they're ready. But since the end of the Cold War, new threats have emerged. Multinational terrorist organizations, rogue states, roving groups of armed pirates. Over the last few years, we have been faced with threats that we didn't envision many years ago. And one of the things that uh, the Navy realized is we have these four great submarines that we can use to meet this new threat. So the Navy came up with a radical plan convert four of their boomers into a new type of submarine with conventional weapons, the SSGN. The price tag? Over a billion dollars each. Not cheap, but less than half what it would cost to build a new sub from scratch. If you take uh, four ships that are no longer needed for their strategic mission and convert them to carry out a new and different mission for the Navy. The Florida ascends to periscope depth in search of the ship that will bring their new guests, a platoon of special operations forces. The bulk of the sub hides like an iceberg just beneath the waves, waiting for the next phase of operations to begin. The Florida has a conventional periscope that uses prisms to reflect and magnify images. You can see really well out of the number one scope, but at nighttime you can't see it all. So she has some new toys. A collection of high resolution cameras and sensors mounted inside a photonics mast. This is your joystick. It's pretty much just like a video game controller. You point it at whatever you want to look at and you shoot things and if you need to look at them closer, you can zoom in and out with this thing. The screen works like a TV, with one channel in color, one in 720p high definition, and one in infrared for night vision. Infrared camera will detect a one degree temperature and change in the environment, so you can see all the water from the different waves, you can see the clouds, you can see the sky. The photonics mast can even measure the distance and course of another ship. It'll shoot out a laser and you hit a broad side of the boat and it comes back and it tells you how far away it was, what a bearing is, and the time you took it. It makes life a lot easier for, for me trying to figure out who I'm looking at. The transport ship arrives at dusk, right on time. 
Captain Kreitz will wait for complete darkness before bringing the sub all the way to the surface. He can't risk being seen and alerting the enemies that an operation is about to get underway. A platoon of Navy SEALs, 16 of the world's deadliest fighting men, board the USS Florida with Navy divers and additional support personnel. Soon they'll begin a joint operation with the sub, identifying and taking out a suspected terrorist hideout. Special operations forces have used submarines for decades to secretly get them into locations, but never on the scale of the SSGN sub. The SSGN has the capability of carrying on board up to 66 special forces. And they can be from the Army, from the Marine Corps, not only the Navy, and to insert them all at the same time and retrieve them. If you have 66 operators aboard an SSGN platform, that boat is only limited by your imagination. Navy SEALs are among the most elite special operations forces in the world. The name SEAL itself explains the types of insertion platforms that we have via sea, air, or land. We could free fall in to our objective. We could also take helicopters, get into the target. We could take land vehicles, surface boats, and we also have the SSGMs, which to me is the most viable option to use if you want to be undetected. SEALs live by a code that values honor over recognition. Secrecy has become part of their mystique. Our job and our mission is to be secret. In our lives, we feel it should be the same way. There's nothing else more serious than that. With the SEALs safely on board, the navigation officer plots a course to the drop zone, 250 miles away. A beach off the coast of the Middle East, used by known enemies of the United States. Back in the day, they used to use paper charts. We would have depths, geographic features, all of that that you would have had on a chart back in the day, you now have in what's called a digital nautical chart, a DNC. The navigation officer is responsible for knowing exactly where the boat is at all times. We have military and commercial GPS capabilities, which provide us accurate position when we're on the surface. And then we verify that using standard methods of navigation. But underwater, knowing where the sub is in three dimensions is much more complicated. When I go submerged, I lose the capability to be able to see things. So when I go down, I use what's called an inertial navigation system. The system basically takes some point in time that I had a GPS fix, and I say I'm accurately right here, I insert it in my system. My system then begins doing calculations after that based on ship's motion forward and aft, roll left, right, and then it gives me its best estimate where I think I am. Inherent in any type of navigation system, you have some probability of error that you don't really know where you are. So therefore, we have a circle around us, which is our position uncertainty circle, and we say, okay, the ship has to be somewhere within this circle. The exact position of the sub is a judgment call. And even with all the training in the world, people sometimes make mistakes. Tragic lesson number one, the Red Sea. 2008. Officers on board a British submarine, the HMS Superb, alter their course in order to cut travel time. After consulting their charts, officers agree to dive to 250 meters. Shortly afterward, the sub collides with a massive underwater rock, suffering significant damage to her bow. The accident was later blamed on human error. All three officers on the watch had misread the depth on their charts. They mistook a one for a seven. The huge rock wasn't at 732 meters. It was at 132 meters. Whether from collisions, depth charges, torpedoes, or accidental explosions, Plenty of subs have sprung massive leaks underwater.
Every new recruit learns in their first days at subschool how to fight back the sea. As thousands of gallons of water stream into this simulated engine room, these submariners quickly understand the reality of flooding. We try to give them the most realistic, you know, chaotic situation we can, so when they actually go to sea, that something does go wrong, and they have to combat casualties, that there's no problems to calm, cool, collective, and handle any situations that comes their direction. If I have flooding coming into the ship, I've got to rely on my crew to be able to stop that, so they've got to be trained and ready to do that. Other simulations teach the men how to operate the sub at angles too extreme to perform safely at sea. Complacency is probably about the worst enemy on a submarine because the uh, environment is so challenging. One mistake uh, can take the life of, of over 100 men. So we want to make sure that we're on top of our game. The ship is on the surface and holding, sir. The ship is on the surface and holding. The USS Florida's closing in on the drop zone. Attaching authority is known as manager, launch area controller. Key personnel go over the details of the Navy SEAL insertion. You got here the insertion and recovery track for inserting the special warfare team with their SDV. It's a 080 leg for the uh, insertion and recovery, and then a 180 course back to the PLP. The Florida has been equipped with special tools that make this mission possible. As part of her billion dollar makeover, the Navy removed all 24 nuclear tipped ballistic missiles, freeing up the missile tubes for other uses. Well, right now we're in the missile compartment. We like to call it the mouse house. We had 24 tubes that were able to house 24 Trident II missiles. We took the first two tubes and made them into lock for uh, SEAL operations. These lockout chambers allow divers to enter and exit the sub while submerged. One of the lockout chambers opens into a dry deck shelter, or DDS a 38-foot-long removable steel hangar mounted to the sub's deck. Inside the DDS is one of the SEAL's favorite tools for special ops, a miniature submersible called a SEAL Delivery Vehicle, or SDV. The two red circles are where we'll actually release the SDV from the tether and send the SEALs into the beach. Once on the beach, the SEALs will confirm the location coordinates and verify the presence of any terrorist leaders. Once we have a visual and they've confirmed the uh, target, we'll be tasked with doing our strike. Command battle station strike. The strike will come in the form of six Tomahawk missiles launched from the Florida herself. The USS Florida is 50 miles from shore and 100 feet underwater. Preparing to begin a joint operation in a few hours. Just above them, the surface is crowded with merchant ships and warships, both friendly and hostile, that they must avoid. Below lay foreign submarines, seamounts, and even whales. All are invisible to the Florida while she's underwater. Unlike the tourist submarines, there are no windows. The periscope doesn't do us any good while we're submerged. But she doesn't have to see these dangers because she can hear them. What we rely on when we're submerged is using the sonar system to figure out what is in the environment around the ship, uh, whether it be up on the surface or another submarine out in the ocean. Light energy slows down in denser materials. It travels 93 million miles from the sun, but it's stopped by only a few thousand feet of ocean. Sound is the opposite. It travels much more efficiently in water. Sound energy will travel hundreds of miles through the water. It's not uncommon to hear contacts 
hundreds of miles away and whales two, three, four hundred miles away. Sonar operators spend six hours a day sitting in this dark room, listening to the soundtrack of the abyss. On the front of the boat is a big dome and it's got hydrophones, a little over a thousand on there. Computers convert acoustic energy into electrical energy and amplify it. Objects in the water, or traces, appear as white lines. You see a trace, and then you take your cursor over and you take a listen to it. These are shrimp, the ones that are clicking, they're cracking when they're moving. Biologics are anything that's alive in the ocean. Mostly that's what we hear 99% of the time. It is biologics, whether it's whales or shrimp. There's a dolphin probably right there, swimming right in front of us. Thirty miles from shore and seventy feet underwater, Captain Kreitz sneaks the Florida into position. The SEAL team prepares for the launch green light. They'll have 16 hours to complete the operation and get back on board the sub. Navy divers have to prepare the SEAL delivery vehicle for launch. Launch route one's open. Crew monitors the SEAL operation from inside Florida. A stand been complete. Max depth two zero feet. All divers are standing in. The SEAL delivery vehicle looks like a torpedo with seats, but there are no weapons built in. This is a Mark 8 Mod 1 SEAL delivery vehicle. It's approximately 21 feet long. It weighs anywhere from five to 6,000 pounds, depending on if it has batteries in it. Its job is to get SEALs secretly on land and back again without ever coming to the surface. Nothing moves in the world without somebody knowing about it. It's anywhere from space to just above sea level. Someone knows it's moving. But not the SDV submersible. It's just one of those things that you just generally can't defend against it. The Navy won't say how many times they've used SDVs in real world missions. But one recent operation has become public. In 2003, just days before the invasion of Iraq, SEAL delivery vehicles pull up underneath two oil platforms 12 miles out in the Persian Gulf. The SEALs leave the SDVs on the bottom and swim to the surface, where they photograph the platforms and assess Iraqi security. Their intelligence work leads to a successful mission. A follow-on assault force takes the oil terminals, preventing their sabotage by Iraqi security forces. A lot of people call this a submarine, and we prefer to call it a submersible. It's completely open to the environment, to the water, to the hot, to the cold, to the little creatures, jellyfish. You're at the mercy of the water temperature, the duration of the dive itself. That takes a tremendous toll on the human body. We get through that through conditioning, through technology, and just plain tenacity. Being part of an SDV team is one of the most intense and dangerous jobs in the military, even by SEAL standards. It crushes just about everybody. No matter how cold you are or how miserable, or at what point your fingers and hands stop moving, you're not getting out of the water. You're either mentally tough enough to gut it out, or you can go ahead and leave. <laughs> That's all there is to it. SDV transits can last upwards of six hours each way. There have been times I've been so exhausted I have fallen asleep underwater. Frogmen aren't the only ones on an SDV team. Highly trained technicians make sure that the SDVs work right every time. 
there's no room for error. My job today is to get the SDV ready for a night dive evolution. They're going to be doing a training dive this evening, obviously putting it in a wet environment. We have to make sure that the electronics and the things that need to be watertight are watertight. We have to make sure that the breathing system, the ballast and trim system, the control system, the propulsion system are all in good working order. Many of the SDV's capabilities, like speed and maximum depth, remain secret. If you don't mind now, I'm going to check the control display units. If you guys could move the camera angle away. These students will spend the next six hours training underwater. They're well aware of the occupational hazards associated with the job. First of all, you can dehydrate. Your body can start cramping up. You could have pulmonary inflation syndrome, hypercapnia, hypoxia, a barotrauma, ear squeeze, O2 toxicity, CNS toxicity. Your tooth can actually explode in your mouth due to pressure changes. You could have arterial gas embolism. There's probably no coming back from that one. Today, the water outside the USS Florida is 58 degrees and the currents are under two knots. The mission is a go. The seals move quickly and carefully. Conditions could change at any moment. Back on the Florida, a tense waiting game begins. For the next six hours, while awaiting word from the seals on shore, the crew must remain silent. They must hear without being heard. If the Florida were detected this close to enemy shores in shallow water, she could have a fight on her hands. The SEAL delivery team has traveled 12 miles since leaving USS Florida. They're almost halfway to the beach and the next stage of their mission. It'll be at least another three hours before the SEALs make landfall and can radio their position back to the submarine. While the SDV team is in transit, there isn't much the Florida crew can do but watch and wait. As if the tension of waiting, the lack of daylight, and isolation weren't enough, most of the crew doesn't know where they are, where they're going, or when they'll be called into action. Can't think about where am I, what am I doing, how much longer do we have, and because uh, that'll just it just makes us things longer. In their sunless underwater world, submariners live on a different clock than the rest of us. We're in six hour rotations. Six hours of that's gonna be on watch. Uh, six hours of that's gonna be your training and your maintenance. And that leaves you about six hours to catch up everything else you wanna do. And then the day starts over again. The newest submariners, or non-quals, spend any available free time studying for their qualifications. From the first day you show up, you know, they give you a big stack of qual cards and they say, you know, get qualified, get to work. A qual card is basically a list of different knowledge factors and practical factors that you have to perform. Each card must be signed by a superior. They want to know that you know everything, how to combat a fire, flooding, how to operate this valve, where to find this location at, because they know that when the chips are down, they depend on you. Once all his cards are signed, a non-qual has arrived. He earns his dolphins initiation into the fraternity of submariners. That's a crew saying, I trust you to save my life. Non-quals have a year to learn a mind-boggling amount of highly technical information. Everything from nuclear propulsion to steering control to the life support systems. Theoretically, Florida could stay underwater for years without ever coming to the surface if they could somehow feed the crew for that long. We don't need any fuel. We produce our own fuel with the, with the nuclear reactor. We make our own oxygen, we clean our own air. A submerged submarine is in a constant life and death struggle with the sea itself. 
It begins with the very air they breathe. The problem on board USS Florida is that when you get 155 guys on board, you shut all the hatches, we got, you got, we're producing CO2, CO, and we're depleting our oxygen levels. And in this space right here, we, we're able to remove that. Sailors generate over two pounds of CO2, or carbon dioxide, per day, per person. That air is pumped into scrubbers, which separate the CO2 out and absorb it by blowing it across a chemical called monoethanolamine. Once isolated, it's then pumped overboard. But they still need to make more oxygen. Okay, these are our two oxygen generators on board. This one here is Mary Kate. She runs really good. We got uh, Ashley. She's kind of uh, temperamental at times. <laughs> now we make our oxygen at electrolysis. We split water molecules. Hydrogen and oxygen is produced. The hydrogen, we pump it overboard. Oxygen, we take it and we can distribute it throughout the ship, or we can pump it and supply it into two oxygen banks that we have. Carbon dioxide poisoning has plagued submariners since the early days, so crews are trained to recognize the warning signs. Headache, nausea, and in very high amounts, coma or even death. And death haunts them on every patrol. Tragic lesson number two, the Russian submarine Kursk. In 2000, a massive explosion in the torpedo room, registering 3.5 on the Richter scale, blows a hole in the Kursk's bow. The crippled sub sinks to the bottom of the Barents Sea with 118 sailors. It's believed that those who likely did survive the explosion may have died a painful death from carbon dioxide poisoning before they could be rescued. The Navy SEAL team travels to within a few hundred feet of shore and parks the mini-sub on the sea floor. They swim the rest of the way into the beach, carrying everything they need for the mission. Bringing people across the beach from underwater is just smart. They don't know you're there until after you've been there and probably gone, if they even know. The seals take cover behind a rock outcropping, 500 yards from the suspected targets. Snipers keep watch as they take GPS readings to pinpoint the target coordinates. Whiskey Tango, this is Foxtrot Alpha. I hold you Lima Charlie. Inside the Florida, officers communicate with the seals in real time from the Battle Management Center, or BMC a joint operations communication center designed specially for this new generation of submarine. High value unit standing by command HQ. Officers on the Florida communicate with troops, surface ships, and commanders on land through radio, as well as through electronic communications over secure networks. The communications on board this sub is pretty amazing. We use chat where we will set up chat rooms for specific events the only people that can get into those rooms are people involved in the operation. So it allows all the commanders to actually watch as it unfolds. In the future, the crew may pilot unmanned aerial vehicles from the BMC as well. Eventually we will have submarines that will have UAV capability and certainly there would be no better submarine today than, than the ESSGN to do that. Still in testing stages, the Cormorant UAV is designed by Lockheed Aeronautics to be launched from the sub's missile tube. After floating to the surface, it would fire booster rockets, sending it airborne. Once it penetrates enemy airspace, the Cormorant could gather valuable intelligence, like identifying armed combatants in advance of a SEAL insertion. Back at the target site, 
the SEAL commander confirms that these are the buildings they're looking for. And the terrorists are inside. Copy all. You hold targets standing by, preparing for strike tasking. Man, battle station strike. Quartermaster report best course to the launch point. 10 by 1759. It's on our fire control test. Commence missile preparations for launch. MCC control. Commence missile preparations for launch. The strike comes in the form of Tomahawk cruise missiles launched from the Florida's missile tubes. She can carry 154 missiles. That's over half the number fired during the entire 1991 Persian Gulf War. It's just mind-boggling. It'll take every other shooter that might play an exercise to equal the payload that we're going to drop and just practice. You know, just sit there and go, oh my god, that's a game changer right there. Commence missile preparations for launch. Commence missile preparations for launch, aye. FCC, commence missile preparations for launch. Commence missile preparations for launch, aye, sir. Make tubes 4, 11, 12, ready for launch or launch up 7, 6 feet. All missiles executed while missile portable. Con strike, commence tube preparations for launch, order launch depth 7, 6 feet. Estimate alignment time, block 4 echoes. Once the SEALs are out of harm's way, they let the missiles fly. Firing point procedures, T-LAM strike, Flight Alpha, six primary missiles. Fire point procedures, T-LAM strike, six primary missiles, Flight Alpha, Isaac. One, three, five. Five weapons, fire point procedure, T-LAM strike, Flight Alpha, six primary missiles. T-LAM strike, Flight Alpha, six primary missiles. Those dad, ready for VFP compensation. They're all diving. Strike WCC, plan and complete. Weapons ready, flight alpha. Weapons ready, aye. All right, commence launch from flight alpha in the primary window. Commence launch from flight alpha, primary window. Aye. In the window, launching four alpha. Launch four alpha. Launching four alpha. The USS Florida lets loose its first Tomahawk cruise missile. Tomahawks have played a role in many of America's major armed conflicts of the past two decades. They travel close to the ground at 550 miles per hour and can deliver a 1,000 pound explosive to targets with pinpoint accuracy. Enough to take out an armored tank or a building. Once we launch it out, it's basically like a small jet aircraft with ordnance on and flies to its target. You can get uh, video feedback from it too. It'll send data back to us of terrain and everything like that. So it's a real smart weapon. Plus, it's guided. During flight, missile techs can see where the Tomahawk is headed and redirect it to another target. Eleven Charlie, away! Eleven Charlie, away. Booster separation. Failed transition to cruise. 11 Charlie. Failed transition to cruise. Plan 059. Replan 059. Replan 059. There's a problem. One of the Tomahawk's engines has failed to kick in after launch. It's dead in the water. TA, this is Florida. Casually failed transition to cruise. 11 Charlie affecting missiles. Missile techs have to shut down the missile and get another one airborne in a hurry, or the mission will be compromised. The Tomahawk missile is propelled out of the sub and into the air by a solid rocket booster. After a few seconds, the booster drops off and a jet engine is supposed to kick in. But that didn't happen. Everyone in the missile control center has a procedure that tells them what to do in the event of a missile failure. Every single thing on this boat has a procedure. Uh, there's probably a procedure on how to make coffee. Uh, and, you know, you're expected to follow that procedure just as diligently as you're expected to follow a procedure on how to execute strike. Flight Alpha. From the captain all the way down to our missile managers, they all have a script that they will follow and they understand who's going to give them the order, what they're expected to do, and then what report they're supposed to make and who they're making that to. And a lot of procedures on a submarine are written in blood because they have messed this up in the past. 
Missile manager, execute MSN 7475. Execute MSN 7475. Learning this procedure began back on land in a room called the strike trainer. Launching 21 Echo, MSN 6461. Booster arm, 21 Echo. Booster separation. Fail, transition to cruise. Very well. Hedgehog. Missile manager, execute Florida. MSN 7462. Fail, transition to cruise. Utilizing ready spare, MSN 6462. Over. Intend to align additional four echo missile. Execute on time. Over. It's this repeated practice that helps the crew of the Florida know exactly what to do when something goes wrong. Full line additional echo missile. We'll launch on time. Launching 12 Alpha. Booster arm 12 Alpha. 12 Alpha away. 12 Alpha away. Booster separation. Transition to cruise. Gems are flight alpha complete. Leave a good help us now as well. Sixteen hours after leaving the Florida, the SEAL team returned safely to the submarine. The mission was a big success, even though not a single missile was actually fired. This was a highly realistic training exercise. Navy SEALs meet up with the SSGNs periodically to practice with the sub crews under real world conditions. The exercise also gives three non-qualified submariners the chance to complete their last qual cards and earn their dolphins. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. Greetings. Know ye that reposing special trust in the fidelity and abilities of electrician's mate, fireman, Matthew J. Kepler, Lieutenant Junior Grade, Curran D. Short. It feels great. It feels amazing. I'm very proud. Uh, my family's proud of me. I've been emailing my wife, the Sailor Mail. She's proud of me. And uh, yeah, definitely working hard. Lost a lot of sleep for this. So. Each time we dive into the depths to carry out our mission, the guarantee our success and safe return is only partly due to the engineering marvel that we work on. The main ingredient was the crew and their training. Today, you join the small brotherhood, this fraternity of master mariners called Submariners. Your new dolphins are more than a badge and symbol of what you've done. They're a reminder of the trust we, your shipmates, have in you to do the right thing to get the job done right. Don't let your word the day I earned my dolphins was probably one of the best days of my life because you're accepted by your peers. And that's the most important part is that they accept you. All right, guys. Good work. They are now part of the fraternity. Although we're very proud of these, when you get these, you're not done. That's like your license to learn. Three months later, the USS Florida returns home to Kings Bay, Georgia. Even with all the high-tech eyes and ears on board, the helmsmen steering the sub still depend on the men in the bridge to guide them into port. But you'll have to get your learner's permit before they'll let you behind the wheel of an 18,000-ton SSGN. Motor vessel Conger, motor vessel Conger, this is surface submarine officer starboard bow. Junior officers practice navigating the boat on virtual reality trainers. Allows me to, to look around uh, as if I'm in the bridge of the submarine. Uh, in front of me, I have my compass. It'll show my course. Uh, to my left is my radar. Uh, down here, bridge box shows uh, speed and rudder. Helm, steer course 135. Steer course 135, helm 5. The voice you just heard was the computer acting as a helmsman. Uh, when I give the order to change course, he'll control the rudder, and I go to that order course. In a few weeks, this junior officer will be out at sea piloting the real submarine. He's part of the Florida's gold crew. They've been training on dry land, while the blue crew has been out conducting the Navy SEAL exercise. Every SSGN has two complete crews who hand control of the sub back and forth. 
The primary reason for having a two crew system is to allow the ship itself to stay out at sea for long periods of time. Most other submarines and surface ships that have a single crew, you would have the ship and the, and the crew be gone for probably 35 or 40 percent of the time. We can keep the ship at sea for about 70 percent of the time. Flight Alpha, six primary missiles. The Navy can't afford any downtime for the USS Florida. Her unique tools and weapons make her the perfect secret warship for the 21st century.